Story continued from a Petasaurus episode. Half a day has passed since the female Ceratosaurus encountered the Apatosaurus herd, and she has continued moving along the river looking for an aquatic meal. Her search has brought her closer to the open fern prairies, and to a narrower section of the river. With her eyes on the water, she doesn't notice the new herd of sauropods, until one of them groans slowly. Looking up, the carnival sees a different species is making its way through the forest, only a hundred meters away. Though they look similar to the Apatosaurus, these are Brontosaurus, close relatives but smaller and stockier. They slowly move their long bodies through the forest, only occasionally stopping to feed on the low-lying vegetation. Brontosaurus are more used to open areas where they aren't so restricted, but on their long travels they inevitably have to cross through forested areas in order to get to their favourite locations. For them it can be quite irritating as they often brush against foliage or have to curve and wind their necks and tails through the tall trees. This is especially irritating for the larger individuals that can reach 22 metres long. For the smaller members of the herd, their worries are far more serious. The forest can hide predators far more easily than on the open fields, and when the foliage is thick or fog rolls in, they can often only see what is directly in front of themselves. For resident species of the forest such as the Ceratosaurus, the Brontosaurus are simply a nuisance, though one that can weigh 20 tons apiece. Fortunately, the herd aren't moving in her direction, so the female continues her search for food. She can smell that one of the herd has fresh wounds, a 15 meter individual with bite marks on her leg that can't be much more older than a few hours. But the Ceratosaurus doesn't even consider hunting even a wounded Brontosaurus of that size, not even with her pack. Fortunately for her, she has spotted a potential meal. Rested on the muddy banks of the creek is a crocodilomorph, Ampiocotylus. The 4 meter reptile has been making its way along the steadily drying creek towards the larger river, but he hasn't moved fast enough, and now the scarred face Ceratosaurus had him in her sights. The dinosaur zeroed in on the crocodilomorph, and took slow steady steps, not wanting to sprint right away and let him get into the shallow water where grabbing him would be more difficult. The crocodilomorph remained motionless, hoping his camouflage would work, but the scarred female had a lock on him, and with her body low to the ground, she slowly edged towards him. There was a slight rustle of leaves to her rear, and the hunter froze completely still. She then carefully turned her head to see if what had made the noise was a threat, and indeed it was. Through the foliage, the Ceratosaurus could make out the features of another predator, a much larger one, Saurophaganax. The 12 meter long super predator was barely hidden amongst the trees, and was standing completely still, breathing long and deep. The scarred female remained still even with the giant no more than 70 meters away. As her heart rate began to spike, she noticed the Saurophaganax wasn't looking in her direction. He was instead looking at the herd of Brontosaurus to her rear. She wasn't the giant carnival's target. They were. But now the female wasn't sure if she should start the hunt, as the Saurophaganax might decide to steal her kill off her. The seconds ticked by, and both of the predatory dinosaurs remained as still as statues while the Brontosaurus feed and move amongst themselves, completely oblivious. Eventually, it was the smaller crocodiliform that moves first. Pushing his body along the mud towards the water, the Ceratosaurus decides to risk it and bolts towards her prey. The Ampula Cotylus gets to the water first, but as he sinks below the surface, his tail is grabbed by the Ceratosaurus's jaws. She pulls him backwards, and the croc flails in the water trying to escape her grasp, splashing and sending water in all directions. The commotion draws the attention of some of the Brontosaurus, who look in the direction of the scuffle. This is exactly what the Saurophaganax has been waiting for, and he charged the herd. Despite his size, the predator was quick on his feet, and got in close before the sauropods could react, and he aimed straight for the wounded individual. The Brontosaurus tried to move away, but the Saurophaganax bit down on its neck and pulled backwards. As the herbivore tried to free itself, it only made the carnival's teeth cut deeper into its neck, and blood flowed from the open wound, splashing the attacker's face and the ground beneath them. The Ceratosaurus pulled her prize out of the water, and with its tail in her jaws and its body on the ground, she ran as fast as she could to put as much distance between herself and the Brontosaurus herd. Meanwhile, the Saurophaganax tore open the victim's neck, but the sauropod's hide was incredibly thick, and he hadn't managed to sever any vital organs. 
He needed more time, but he didn't have any. As a massive Brontosaurus was stomping towards him, intent on rescuing the smaller herd member. Surprisingly, the carnivore let go of his victim, turned around and started to retreat. But it was a little too late, as the large Brontosaurus swung his huge neck and bashed it against the predator's body. Saurophaganax slid on the ground and collapsed to his side, but before the Brontosaurus could crush him under his feet, he righted himself and stood back up, moving away from the herd. The Brontosaurus could do nothing but watch him run, and eventually had to continue on their trek. Though it looked like the large carnivore had failed, this was his plan. The previous injury to the Brontosaurus's leg was made by him earlier in the day, and he had been stalking the herd ever since, waiting for the right moment to follow up with another attack. He will do this as many times as it takes until he has injured the one Brontosaurus enough that it succumbs to its wounds. Despite the extreme damage to its neck, this Brontosaurus is still soldiering on, and it would likely weather many more attacks. Its battle with the Saurophaganax could take days. Elsewhere, the female Ceratosaurus feeds on the dead croc she pulled from the creek. There was certainly a close call, but it seemed the Saurophaganax was fully invested in bringing down the Brontosaurus. She hoped no other predators came out of nowhere to steal her kill, but in the immediate future, maybe feeding off the Saurophaganax's next kill would be the closest thing to a free meal. Hello fellow travellers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down the Thunder Lizard itself, Brontosaurus. Brontosaurus's first remains were first discovered in 1879 in Wyoming by Othniel Charles Marsh. This was during the time in paleontology known as the Bone Wars, which began between Marsh and Edward Drinker Cope, who tried to discover and name as many prehistoric species as possible, while also sabotaging and stealing from each other amongst many other things. This conflict would do far more harm than good, and ruin both men, but that is a story for another time. Upon finding the remains, Marsh saw it as a new genus, and gave it the genus name Brontosaurus, meaning Thunder Lizard, and the species name Excelsus, meaning Noble. More remains would be found and assigned to Brontosaurus, even though it was hard to differentiate them from a Patosaurus, which was also named by Marsh. This came to a head in 1903, when Elmer Riggs described in the geological series of the Field Columbian Museum that there weren't enough differences between Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus for them to be separate genuses, and the two were synonymous. Since Apatosaurus was discovered first, the genus would keep its name, and Brontosaurus became a nomen dubium. And so scientifically, Brontosaurus was cast aside, but in the public eye it persisted with everything from films to stamps using the name, and staying in the public consciousness, and no doubt leading to many people calling it Brontosaurus and someone going, uh, actually, or something like that. This went on for over a century, until 2015. A joint British-Portuguese research team had set out to better classify the species and morphology of the Diplodocidae family, examining over 80 different specimens from across the globe. In this process, they had concluded that there were enough differences between the specimens of Apatosaurus and those previously named as Brontosaurus for them to be different animals. And so Brontosaurus was in a way resurrected as its own genus, and now sits in the Apatosaurinae subfamily with three species alongside the two subspecies of Apatosaurus. This even got mainstream media attention, with many people elated that the Thunder Lizard had made a triumphant return and ignoring all the other research that the scientists had put into their work. Though it should be noted that not all agree with this paper, and so it is still up for change. The genus of Brontosaurus lived in North America between 156 and 146 million years ago in the late Jurassic. The three species in order of discovery are Excelsis, found in 1879, Haveris, discovered in 1902, and Yarnapin, found in 1994. Excelsis was the largest, growing to between 21 and 23 meters long, stood between 4 and 5 meters tall at the hip, and weighed between 15 and 20 tons, with high estimates putting it closer to 30 tons. The main difference between itself and Apatosaurus was that Apatosaurus was larger, with a thicker and lower set neck than Brontosaurus. It had a typical build for a Diplodocidae sauropod, with a small head held by a long, stiff neck, 
four pillar-like legs and a long tail with a whip-like end. Its body was held in a more horizontal position, as opposed to the more vertical sauropod species like Brachiosaurus or Camarasaurus, as its front legs were slightly shorter than its hind legs. You'll often see the Brontosaurus depicted holding its head up high so that it could feed on high foliage, but this is not how it held its head or how it ate. Though it may have been able to lift its head up into this position, it was likely not very easy or comfortable for it to do. Instead, Brontosaurus held its head horizontally from its body, and was a generalist low browser or grazer, feeding on ferns, cycadoids, seed ferns, and horsetails. We do not have a skull for Brontosaurus, but we do have one for Apatosaurus, and they were likely very similar. The skull was squarish and lined with spatula-shaped teeth that lacked denticles. They were strongly cylindrical and came in rows that were replaced all at once with new rows growing behind the old ones. These teeth were a lot thicker and replaced more often than those of their close relatives, the Diplodocidae, and may mean that Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus went after tougher food than their cousins. Though they couldn't arch their necks up high, they could move them sideways very well. This has led scientists to theorize in order to fuel their giant bodies and expend as little energy as possible. These low browsing sauropods would stand in one spot and then move their heads in a wide arc, swallowing down everything they could reach in that arc. Once they had cleared that section, they would take a few steps forward and repeat the process. This would have been a lifelong endeavor, as these massive animals started out weighing about 5 kilograms, and depending on what calculation method used, they could have put on 500 kilograms a year. They grew incredibly fast, reaching maturity at only 10 to 15 years, and though we don't know if they continue to grow throughout their lives, or if their growth slowed once they reached maturity, they could have lived to between 50 and 100 years. The limbs of Brontosaurus were some of the most robust of all sauropods, far more so than the relatively slender limbs of Diplodocus, and were actually quite similar to Camarasaurus. It did have claws on its feet, but it's not quite known if they were used for anything. The claws face inwards, so it wouldn't have been useful in defending itself. Some suggest that females could have used them to dig up the ground to lay their eggs, or they helped them grab onto trees when they reared up on their hind legs in order to push a tree to the ground. One interesting theory that has come out recently is the possibility of neck combat. This has come from the bones in the neck. The cervicals are very robust and formed a V-shape that could have served as protection for the tissues and organs of the neck. All this extra bone would have held massive muscles that would have given them great power, especially when driving their necks downward. It has even been suggested that the cervical ribs coming off the vertebra may have been attachment points to external bosses or keratinous spikes. This is why we see some artwork with Brontosaurus and other sauropods with spike-like protrusions on the undersides of their necks. So how were male Brontosaurus using them against each other? It may have been a bit like giraffes who fight with their necks, though they are usually trying to hit each other with the spikes on the tops of their heads. It could have been that Brontosaurus would walk up beside each other and rear up on the hind legs and try and force their neck down on the opponent's neck, a bit like how we see it depicted on the second episode of Walking with Dinosaurs or a bit more like in Prehistoric Planet Season 1, where they would face each other directly and slam against each other, using their whole bodies. At the moment, the idea of neck combat is still just a working theory, though the fact that Brontosaurus developed such impressive necks means they must have been selecting for them, and it would have also needed more energy and even been a strain on the body at some times. So, Brontosaurus. One of the most recognizable dinosaur names that not everyone realizes got canned for over a century. To me, it shows that anything can happen in paleontology. And who knows, maybe Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus will become the same species again. But what do you think of Brontosaurus? And for my question of the week, is there a Nomen dubium species you want brought back into existence? What lesser known dinosaur would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching. Am I the only one that didn't care that Brontosaurus was brought back? Like, everyone's like, Oh, Brontosaurus is so cool, it means the Thunder Lizard. Like, yeah, but you're not calling it the Thunder Lizard. You're calling it Brontosaurus. It doesn't, I'm sorry, it does not sound that much cooler than a Patosaurus. Am I the only one who, am I the only one who thinks that? I think I am. I'm not, I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. <laughs>